There we go. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you coming. This is absolutely amazing. I, did, I expected a nice little group right here. <laughs> and, and here we are, almost full in Madison Recital Hall. Thank you. Um, honestly, this is one of the most surreal experiences I've had of, of, of all of the, uh, the things that she mentions and you know, my life path. Standing here speaking to you is kind of weird, surreal, because I'm still that podunk kid that grew up in Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> That's just me. And I don't have any amazing, earth-shattering things to tell you today, but maybe they are for somebody in here. I don't know. And some of the things that have come to me, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention one thing that's kind of earth-shattering and exciting for me, and then we'll come back to it right at the end. Um, but as I've traveled across the world and met with, with every level of life and, uh, and felt the heartbeat of humanity, it's been amazing for me to see that there are naysayers out there who are saying things are getting worse and worse and we're doomed. And, but if you look at the lifespan of humanity from the Stone Ages throughout the ages, then we hit the industrial and the technological, and then uh, the space age, and now we're in the information age, right on the precipice, ready to go into a new age. That new age is the age of enlightenment. It's amazing what's happening out in the world and the good that's happening from people just like you who are going out and making such a huge difference in the world and lifting humanity in so many ways. So, that, to me, that's earth shattering and exciting because it's absolutely true, that age of enlightenment is coming. Um, but honestly, this standing here, it's, it's really interesting because there are members of this audience who stood here 20 years ago and shared their life stories with me. And that changed my life. They shared their knowledge and wisdom and set a foundation for me and a trajectory that I didn't know was possible. And, and, I, and I thank you. And family who are here, who have been here, and been there for me and with me, through the, all the ups and downs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so like I said, this is surreal because I'm, I'm inside, I'm still that podunk kid. Honestly, when I was growing up, <laughs> I'm going to take you on a little journey here in the next, uh, next half hour or so. Um, we're going to, I'm just going to hit some stepping stones just so you can see a little bit of the journey that I took that honestly ended up with impossible dreams that I had no way I could have dreamed about back then. Um, so, actually, there we are, that's it, right there. Okay, now we're ready to start. So, I, yeah, I, I think I masked it okay, but I was really awkward. I was odd. I did not fit in. I had no idea what, I, I, but I was a go-getter. And I put myself 100% into everything I did. And, uh, okay, let me give you a little example. So growing up, yeah, uh, junior high, dance. I asked a girl to dance. This is just one little example, I'll give you an idea. I asked a girl to dance, and uh, we went out there, and I was so nervous to dance with her. And I remember this very well, because it was the first time I was dancing, and I was looking around, going, I hope nobody's looking at me. Okay, should I talk to her? No, no, I'm just, it's cool. We'll just talk. It's all good. Um, okay. Um, uh, and then I thought, I'm going to do something different. I, I'm tired of doing this. I've done it my whole life. I, I'm a junior high. But I was like, I, this is all we do at the dances, and I get, and I'm gonna bust down a little bit. I'm gonna do something different. Um, uh, <laughs> <sighs> I hope 
hope nobody saw that. <laughs> oh, God damn it. That happened. Hey, my hair, curly, like, if it's like, not, if it's not this long, then it froze. I wake up in the morning, it falls side to side. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to do, use product. I didn't know, and so I would part it on the side and comb it hard to the side and try to, and then I would part it in the middle and do a little leave it to beaver. So I, I tried to tame it. I tried so hard. And uh, yeah, so we already, we already uh, covered this one, but um, I tried so hard to, to, to just fit in to do everything right, and everything. but not fitting in it was interesting because I had this drive, this passion, right? And I, was, and I didn't understand it. And then I also had, on the other side, I had this uncanny existential awareness that I couldn't really talk about to a lot of people. I thought a lot about eternity, about humanity as a whole, about my legacy. I mean, 10 years old, I was thinking about these things and what am I going to leave? And, and, and I thought symbolically. I would like think about things very symbolically. I'm like, my family will get a kick out of this one. Like, movies were not just movies. They were, they were deeper. Like, there's more to this than just a fun little movie. There's, a, there's something. And did you guys know that the Disney animation of Cinderella tells the whole plan of salvation? <laughs> I would love to get a nice Facebook response from some of you in a week or so after you've gone back and looked at it and analyzed it in depth and written scripture references for every scene in Disney Cinderella. I'll do that. Yeah, so you, you get the idea, right? Um, so, so my family, my mom and dad, they taught me wonderful, beautiful things and raised me good and, and taught me the gospel and, and amazing foundation. And one of the things that they, they would say is, okay, when we go to a public place, there were 10 kids in my family, right? So we'd kind of make a mess. But they would say, we need to leave this place better than we found it. And so we'd go and clean it all up and stuff. And in my 10-year-old mind, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder if I... Apply, if I could apply that to my life, I come to earth, maybe can I leave earth better than I found it? When I leave, what will the difference be? Will it matter that I was here? And so, so these ideas were, were in my mind, and I, and I was out there. I said a mantra for I don't even remember when I said it for myself, but it was a uh, uh, life is an adventure. Um, at that time, I didn't know what hashtag was. But if I did, that would have been it. And I still live by that mantra. And I've lived by it the, the, the whole time since I, since I was young. And just as you, you can see, I'm, I'm not one to sit around and pick my nose. Not much. Um, but I, uh, so, I'm, but I'm still, life is an adventure, but I'm still that kid. With the curly hair, I didn't know what to do with it. And, that's, and so, so let's, go, let's go a little deeper on that. Uh -huh. So I actually think the evolution of my, my being comfortable in my skin and, and the dancing and all that, that, that it came about, and actually being able to keep my hair somewhat tame, but then have a personality of its own, and let it flow and be free and, and be what it wanted to be, Right? I think that honestly has a deeper, uh, deeper meaning. <laughs> Seriously, I think there's more. You might want to look at the way you do your hair. Are you forcing it into something that's not what it wants to do? And uh, you're, you know, how comfortable are you in your skin? Go take a dance class and, uh, and get a little bit more comfortable in who you are. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, that, I, that transition, I, I think, was, I, I haven't really studied it out, but I, it's, a, it's a powerful insight that I think I'll write a book on one day. Um, <laughs> just, so, so what happened, all right, and I'm going to jump through this, uh, the, some of these things. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to hit some stepping stones. Um, so, let 
I mean, I'm going to skip a couple things because uh, they, they want me to just end the first years on my thought. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So I went through high school. I was go get them. I, I, I played the French horn. I was on the uh, on, on accent, on ac academics. I was, I'm, I'm going to just read this because I don't have any idea. I was on the wrestling team. I was a debate team captain. I was um, seminary president. Woo. I was the woo seminary president. <laughs> I was uh, in the, in the um, show choirs, right, in high school. And then I did the regional choirs and all state choirs. And, uh, and then I had to get out of the wrestling meets to go to the choir. And then I uh, did um, Boy Scouts, highly active in Boy Scouts, did my AP classes. We had a thing called A Hour. I don't know if you guys know what that is. In high school, it's before school, an, an hour that you could take classes. And they offered that for seniors who were going to graduate, but they needed to get an extra class in, or they couldn't graduate. So I went to my counselor as a sophomore and said, oh, can I take the class A Hour? She's like, why? Said, well, um, it says free education and all, and I get, and I, and I want to learn as much as I can before I graduate. So could I? So I signed up for uh, chemistry, an eight hour, and took it with all the guys who were graduating who had flunked chemistry earlier on. <laughs> and I helped them with their chemistry. Um, they, I also took a class during my lunch hour because we had a full hour for lunch. And I was like, I have to use that time. So I was like, could I take a class during lunch? And she's like, well, when will you eat? Oh, I can take a sack lunch and eat it in between classes. And uh, she was like, Okay, so I did. All through high school. So it was really interesting. This uh, I honestly didn't understand these guys who were trying to ditch classes. And their goal was to round around and do nothing as much as possible. I, I just couldn't relate to it. Um, so it's interesting to me that, okay, I'm going to jump. After high school, still this, this guy, I'd never been in a dance studio. I'd never done anything really in the arts so much. Um, and, and then uh, I took my, <laughs> I don't admit this to my friends on Broadway and my, the community there, but I didn't know Broadway existed um, all the time growing up. No, honestly, I thought it was a thing of the past. I thought it was like vaudeville. Had his heyday? Done. And now we've moved on to rap and r &B. It's all over. And I was so sad because I, my family's kind of vintage. We didn't have like the new stuff, so we would actually listen to the LPs. Do you know who that is? Like it rose you know, the round table and we put the needle on and, and then we'd listen to it. That's what I did growing up. Yeah, so. Um, so anyway, Shani. <laughs> um, we, so I've listened to Oklahoma and Camelot and, and Sound of Music and Sing Along and go, oh, oh, I was born in the wrong era. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so cool that they used to write those things and uh, now it's all over. Oh well, I guess I'll be a doctor. And so I did, and seriously, I went to become, I was all set to become a doctor and I loved chemistry and math and science and my calculus class was like awesome. One of my favorite classes. It was so cool. And uh, seriously, I, love, I loved it. And so I was like, I was fine with that. That was great. Um, but it just so happened I was taking a cousin of mine, I was picking her up from her ballet class. And I went to Gene Wright's dance studio in Mesa, Arizona. And I'm sitting there in the lobby and I'm listening to the music that they're playing over the speaker, and I had never heard it before, and I was like, what is that? It's, it's synthesized, but it's, but it's orchestrated, but it's like ominous and beautiful, but it's like so, something I'd never heard before. And I was like, what in the world? <laughs> this is so cool. How, who did this? Who wrote this? I've never heard anything so amazing just chills up and down my spine. Just like, so I went over and he said, excuse me, um, what is this playing? What is this music? And then he looked at me weird and went, uh, hello, fan of the opera? He's like, no, I've seen the old movie. They did not play this <laughs> And he's like, uh, you know Andrew Lloyd Webber? 
Um, I was like, so when was this written? When did he write this? Like, just a few years ago. It's on Broadway now. But, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me? Well, I, I'm on Broadway. Well, what? Yeah, it's on Broadway right now. There's a Broadway now. <laughs> it's going on now? There are people doing Broadway? Oh! Oh! The angels opened and the, and the clouds parted. And, and it didn't really change my life that much at that time. But in years to come, drastic difference. Like that was the kind of the spawning seed of that moment that said, oh, Broadway still exists. And so, so I moved, moved on from that and uh, I'm, I'm missing some of these. Is it jumping? Oh my gosh, it's jumping. And I'm hitting it? And it's, oh my gosh, you guys have been reading all these cool things <laughs> while I've been talking. Wow, you guys got a glimpse ahead of my time. Oh, that's right, I do have a clicker. Oh, that's right. Uh, for, forcing my hair, there we are. There we are, forcing my hair. Ah, so, okay. So, that, that lens right here, this one, right here, right? Just because you know something doesn't mean you know it. Right? You, we need to be open and ready to learn constantly throughout our lives because your paradigm will shift even when you are in your middle age. And when you be things, you'll learn things and you'll go, and your whole life will go, whoa, 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 okay. Be ready for that. Be open to that. Because that will send you in the right direction. So, um, so okay, so from there, we jump into uh, to college. I come to BYU. And of course, I was pre zoology. <laughs> that was what I had planned. I dreamed about it all the time growing up. I was like, I'm gonna become a doctor. Of course, that's what it is. My mom had 10 kids. People need doctors. <laughs> Being a doctor is not going to go out of fashion. We will always need doctors, so long as there are humans on the earth. So that's what I'm going to do. And I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference, right? So, so I yes, pre-med zoology, and a very wise zoology 339 professor. Don't remember his name. But he was very wise, because he pulled me to the side. And he said, and he said Sean, um, I'm assuming you want to work with people, just getting to know your personality. He's like, yeah, be a doctor, yeah, people. He's like, you might want to change your major because zoology is going to tell them you'll research the rest of your life. Oh, okay, so do something more like human interaction, find, find something in the, the, and do pre-med, something else. Oh, thank you, okay, yeah. So I looked around and there's this new major that they just started called music, dance, theater. I, I was in show choir, how fun. I could be the singing dancing doctor. That would be awesome. So I auditioned. Randy, I'm sorry. I, I, I have not had a chance to apologize for that audition. Um, I was turned down. That, seriously, they said no, you can't be in the major. And um, they, <laughs> they explained to me, they said, you, can, you have raw talent. But you're not developed enough so that you would reach the level of proficiency we need you to by graduation. So, yeah, no thanks. But we'll let you take a couple of the classes, the major classes, if you'd like. So some of the MBT classes. Like, oh, okay, cool. I'll do that. Right? Go get them. Sure. Okay, opportunity. So I did that just before that semester ended. Chuck Whitman, not here anymore, retired. He was my, my professor, theater professor. He pulled me aside and he says, Sean, um, a few of the, the faculty who have taught you over this last semester, we got together and we were talking, and, and we all agree that in all of our time teaching, we've never seen anyone progress as fast as you have this last semester. If you would like to re-audition, we would accept you into the major, if, you, if you'd like to do that. Okay, <laughs> cool, so I did. Um, I, I, yeah, I did not know the first thing about monologues and, and singing solos and dancing and I had no clue. Again, show choir. That was my, that was it. And, and so they took a big chance on me coming in. 
And again, I wanted to say thank you. So it was a struggle. It was such a struggle. So I was pre-med, I, I was a quadruple major. I was pre-med, music, dance, theater. <laughs> 17 to 21 credits every semester. I was killing myself, four hours of sleep. I was just like, but I, that was okay. I, I wanted, well, okay. It wasn't okay. I was killing myself. I had to pick one or the other, and of course it was gonna be medicine. I wanted it my whole life, of course. That's what I needed to do. So I, and I, and I always seek spiritual guidance when I, when I try to make decisions. And so I, I did, I, I prayed about it, and said, of course I need to go into the medical profession, so I need to drop the arts and really focus on what I'm going to do. And I felt nothing. <laughs> Zero. I was like, okay, I need to show faith. I need to move forward. I'm going to do this. And then I'll, it'll all work. I need to step into the dark. So I did, and I changed everything, and, and I moved forward with these other classes, and I did, and I just still felt anxiety and dark and confusion, and, and then I, and I thought, no. <laughs> Stupid thought. Hmm. <laughs> oh, so then I started wrestling with it. And it took me two weeks to wrestle it. And finally, come to say, okay, if this is what I'm supposed to do, I think it's stupid. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> Who lives their life going from audition to audition, not knowing when they're going to have a next job, and literally unemployed, like, unemployed all the time, every time you turn around. Who does that? What kind of a person in the right mind? Okay, whatever, all right. So, so I went and, uh, and switched things around, and I prayed, and this time, there's an undeniable yes. You have to go in the next direction. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I did not think it was the right thing. My mind, my finite mind, said, that's ridiculous. Somebody else knew better. And so, I've learned over the years that if we seek spiritual guidance, not only daily, but in the, especially in the crossroads, honestly, you will be guided to that place where you can do the greatest good. Even though you don't know that yet. So, so I did, 110%, pushed it, made it, made it happen, and uh, one of the most difficult parts of that is the follow through. Even though you don't know why, you gotta have the courage to stick to it and keep going, even though you think, eh, I don't think this is right, but, Keep going. Keep following that. Because there's something down the road you don't know is coming. Very impossible dreams that you don't know enough to dream about yet. And so, so I did. I dove in. And again, I'm a 110% person. And I gave it everything. And um, a, a quick little incident to, uh, to share with you some of the challenges that we faced. I say we because my teachers were right there with me. They struggled with me. There was more than once when my teachers dropped their face into their hands and said, oh dear, what are we gonna do with you, Sean? Oh. It was what it was. I was trying to make up a decade of basic training in a couple of years. So, so quick little incident, which has become legend here at BYU from what I hear. And I wish Dave Tinney were here. Dave Tinney, are you out there? No? I wish he were here because I think he's the one who started it. I think he's the one who, who actually started telling this story to everyone. Because he's the only other one who knows it. So, um, I'm here to clarify any details that may have gone astray over the past 20 years. Okay? And to admit, it was me. Um, so, I, uh, I signed up for my first LA class. I show up, I, I, I'm reading the description, and it says, um, we expect you to wear tights. I don't have any tights. So I asked around, and they said, oh, they have, they have them over at the RV. They have tights for you that you can just throw in your car. It's like shorts and t-shirt, they have the tights over there. Oh, great, okay, they'll take care of it. 
So I go over there, and I show them my card. They give me this black pair of tights and a dance belt. And I take it over, and I'm like, okay. So I put the tights on, and they're, they're, they're really baggy. They've been stretched out. They're old. They're, and, and I'm like, I can't dance in this. They, they'll fall down. And I, oh, that's what, no wonder it's called a dance belt. Oh, so I put the dance belt on and tucked it in a little bit. How smart! It held up the tights. I was thrilled. I was like, oh, they thought of everything. So I marched down the RV, headed down the hall. People are looking at me, giggling, laughing, and I was like, of course, I'm in tights. They don't laugh. Guys don't wear tights, but I do. So I'm walking down, I go into my class, Sandra Allen is teaching. I go to the bar. I'm the only guy in the class. All these girls in the pink tights. And they're, and I'm feeling, you know, a little bit self-conscious in my tights. So I'm like, okay, yeah. And nobody talks to me. I go to my place in the bar. I'm like, I'm ready, you know. And uh, Sandra comes in, she's a little bit flustered. Um, yeah, let's start. Um, um. And so about 10 minutes in the class, Dave Tinney comes walking in, and she's like, <laughs> and he walks over and he's like, um, Sean, can you step outside with me just for a second? He's like, he's like sure. I'm, I'm not in trouble. I'm, 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 I'm a good student. I'm sure I'm not in trouble, but maybe they want me to move up a level. Maybe I'm good enough that I should be an intermediate instead of a beginning. I bet you that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, we'll see. I go out there and he explains this. Um, a dance doll is kind of like a dancer's underwear. And it's for support for the male dancer. Um, so it's worn under the tights. So you might want to fix that. Um, oh, hey, hey, thank you. Um, and I did the walk of shame down <laughs> RB hallway. Changed it. Did a little knot to hold the tights up because they were going to fall off anyway. I, and I went back to class. <laughs> You have to be able to look like a fool sometimes if you want to become a master. <laughs> and it's true about any discipline. But the key is to go back to class after you were a fool. And be okay with that. Face the humiliation, walk back into class, smile at everyone, go to your place at the bar, and continue on as if nothing happened. And so, so this is what the teachers got to deal with. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna jump a little bit, and uh, and guess what? I graduated. Okay, I worked so hard, and I was spent so much time in the studios, and my teachers worked so hard, and I graduated with two hundred and twenty eight credits. <laughs> Didn't expect the gas, but yeah, I, I almost yeah, I could have graduated twice almost. Um, but I took a lot of extra classes, you know, I just wanted to learn and grow. And so I took a whole bunch of extra classes, but I still felt under par. I still felt like I wasn't ready to be a professional. And I was oh, what am I going to do? Okay, well, so I've taken a whole bunch of religion classes, like a ton of them. And I checked with the CES department, and I'd taken enough classes, and the, the right classes. And so I went and became a seminary teacher. I was a full-time seminary teacher for CDS for a year. And they assigned me down to St. George. And it was a transition that I was like, oh, I was going to be an artist, but now it looks like I'm going to teach seminary. And uh, it's a big, big sacrifice and another twist in the road. And, but now I understand. I get it. That's why I was supposed to go into the arts, so I could be a better seminary teacher, so I could help all these kids. So I, Now I know. The end of that first year, teaching full-time, they came to me and said, 
uh, Sean, you're not on the roster for next year. We're not sure why, but you're not going to go on next year to Houston. Good luck, go do something, whatever you're going to do with your life. <laughs> no, I, I just sacrificed everything. But... Okay. Uh, uh, well. Interesting thing. You will be guided, and it will be 100%. This is what you're supposed to do. Boom. But then you will be guided somewhere else, either along the way or after you get there. Because that was preparation. You didn't know it. You thought it was the end. But that was preparation. Those twists and turns that you take are all preparation for a future mission that you don't know anything about, but is in your path, if you will follow the guidelines and, and go through those twists and turns. And they, and they will require things of you that you don't have yet, and you're being prepared for them. So. Um, So yeah, I ended up out in, uh, out in New York uh, after that. I, I did a cruise ship, seminary teaching, cruise ship, almost the same thing. Um, <laughs> made connections on that cruise ship to be able to move to New York. In New York, same thing as 100%. I was running, literally, back, back on, running over 100 blocks a day, hitting two to three auditions every single day. And I started booking work. I started getting paying gigs. And I uh, was able to start making a living at this. One of the first gigs I got. Ah, so if you really want something, you will sacrifice what it takes to get it. If you really don't want it that bad, you'll find something else that you do want that bad and go sacrifice what you have to to get that. So find your priorities and be willing to sacrifice for it. And it will come to fruition. Now, one of the first things that happened, which I wish I had time to tell you the story, uh, but I ended up getting a contract with the New York Theater Ballet. A New York Ballet Company! What? <laughs> yeah, and so I danced with New York Theater Ballet. That was not anywhere, I, I, I get it. So this is one of those impossible dreams that... Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Just kidding. <laughs> right, you can see the future slides. It ruins the stories for you, though. No. Um, so, I, so I went ahead and, uh, and, and was able to do New York Theater Ballet and did that for the first year. And soon after that, I went in. I went to the wrong audition. Accidentally. I went, I went three hours early. I was going to sign up so I could be at first on the list. There's a whole line there already. And I was like, three hours before you come. Okay. <laughs> Walk up to the front and they, they go to sign and they say, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't know you. What is your name? What, what are you? And I was like, they don't ask that. <laughs> and my name's Sean Perry. What, um, what are you here for? I'm auditioning for the new musical called Aaron. It's part uh, uh, river dance, part jazz. Never made it. Um, and, and it's going to New Zealand. This is it, right? This is the one. They're like, no, this is the audition for the Mark Graham Dance Company. Oh, oh, God, sorry, so sorry. God, wait, wait, have you ever done any Graham? Oh, a little bit. I took one semester at BYU. Like. <laughs> and I was like, so well, you could audition, you might as well. I was like, okay, sure. What's the worst that can happen? They'll say no. So I did. After three callbacks, Obviously, I, I, I made a fool of myself. But they saw potential enough in me and technique enough that they offered me a contract on Graham 2. And I danced with the Graham company, and then I, I'm still connected to those people and working with them off and on to this day. And do not limit yourself. Don't say no to yourself. Let them say no. <laughs> they will, plenty of times. But sometimes they won't. And a whole new door will open to you and a whole new universe of amazing things. All right, so the time came and I did my Broadway debut. And it just so happened it was 10 years after I first found out that Broadway still existed. 
And it just so happened that it was in the Imperial Theater. Bowing to 2,000 people, standing ovation in none other than Phantom of the Opera. John, 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 John. <laughs> Full circle. Yeah, it was amazing. So, so um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump through some uh, some of these um, cap, cap some things off here that I that I want you to know. If you have to leave for a class, I understand. Go ahead. Um, we're, we're we're fine on time, but but in in the next uh, you know ten minutes here as I finish up, I understand if you have to run. Um, so in between gigs, I would go per, um, teach at different studios, nationally, internationally. I would get they called to teach at different things. And um, Vanya Macias in uh, Peru, she was the prima ballerina for the Municipal Ballet de Lima. I say that. Um, she, this is us performing down in Peru, and um, she, while I was there, let me tell this real quick here, she took me out to the slums and showed me the real Peru. And we ran into these guys who were dancing on the streets. And I said, look, I offered to teach. I said, I'll, I'll stay for an extra couple of weeks. I was supposed to do it for two weeks, but I'll stay for another couple of weeks and work with them. I want to help them. And so we arranged for them to come in, and I worked with them, and I was planning on working with them for a couple more weeks. And so we come in that first day, and I walk in, and I figure, all right, you guys just line up and copy me, all right? So it just mirror me, I'll put the music on, this will be easy. Right? Couldn't do it. They went to, to, off to their corners, and hoods over there, and they were just talking their street Spanish that I didn't understand. And, uh, and I, for four hours, I was trying to pull them and, and, and help them and trying to do it. So I thought, maybe tomorrow will be better. So I come back the next day, same thing. You can't force the, the horse to drink the water. So I was like, I'm done. But again, I needed to seek that spiritual guidance. So that night, I was praying, and I said, you know that I'm not a quitter. You know that. But maybe if I just cut my losses and go somewhere where I can actually accomplish something fruitful, should I go back to New York? And I'm done here, right? This is, this is good. And I meditated and waited. And the only thing that came to me was the same things that are keeping them from doing your class will keep them from getting an education will keep them from having jobs and holding it down, will keep them from having a good family life, or succeeding at any endeavor they might do the rest of their life. Same thing. That was it. It wasn't build an ark. It wasn't do something. <laughs> it was just this idea. So I wrestled with it all night, and then I, I started putting all the symbology that I lived with, and, and literalism, and I started trying to put it together, and I said, okay, maybe I'm here to teach, not dance but these basic life skills. I mean, the things you just basically need that we take for granted, things like, like respect, focus, being able to concentrate for more than 30 seconds at a time, being able to do, like, work together as a team, set goals and work towards those goals, like, just the basics. So I came in the next day with a very different outlook and a different approach. And I walked in, and I stood there and said, and I said, okay, I've got this thing, I'm gonna teach you guys. But I want you, actually, you know what? It's so easy, my grandma can do this stuff. It's so easy. But you don't have what it takes. You can't do it. So I'm not gonna teach you. And I walked out. And they said, what? Whoa, 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 what, what? And they came, they came after me. I said, no, 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 no. You, you said it's easy, we, we, why can't we do it? We, we can do it, I'm sure we can do it. I said, and no, you can't. It is impossible for you. Therefore, I will not teach it to you. Well, well, but maybe we can. I don't know, maybe. Give us a try. Give us a... So, okay, here's the deal. If I teach this to you, every one of you has to do it. If one person gives up, you all gave up, and I quit, and we're out. We're done. Okay? Every single person has to do it. Nobody gives up. If one person makes a mistake, we all made a mistake. And we start over. You guys okay with that? Those are the rules. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can do that. So we all stand in lines. I stand up there, feet together, put a finger in the air. It was the time I had you all do it. But put your finger in the air. And I said, <laughs> got a few participants here. All right, so then I said, I want you to move just your finger for 30 seconds. 
Only your finger. Nothing else. Mark said, and we started. Within two seconds, somebody turned and looked at the, to the side. Like, no, nope, stop. You just move your head. No, I said, only your finger. Oh, okay. So they, it, we struggled. We struggled. And they kept at it. There were a couple of them who kept messing up. Like, at about 15 seconds. They kept laughing or stopping. And they started placing themselves and saying, dude, we're all trying hard and you're messing us up. Man. Come on, do it right. And so then they're like, all right, all right. I'll, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then one of them, he had to close his eyes because he couldn't concentrate. So he was like, So we finally get to this like 28, 29, 30, yes, you guys are high fives, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we do, man. He's like, <laughs> he, you just moved your finger for 30 seconds, why, really? You're so excited? Yeah, but you said that was easy. That, that, that was like trick, that's different. It's like, you're right, you're, you're right. It wasn't easy. But let's look at what you accomplished. You just focused on one tiny little thing for 30 full seconds. You've never done that in your life. And you did it with a whole group of people all together. You've never done that in your whole life. I've got a few other things I wanted to teach you. Do you, do you want to learn them? All right, sure. Yeah, okay. I ended up staying for three months, teaching them four hours a day. The transformation was phenomenal. You could not recognize them from the beginning to the end. Every single one of those guys, here they are. Every single one of them went on to finish school, get jobs. Many of them are performing, performing professionally, teaching the next generation. It's, it, it was phenomenal. It was absolutely amazing. Here they are in a, in a class, a little more disciplined class. Okay? So I went on and said, this has to happen all over the world. So I started Prometheus Spark International, which teaches essential life skills to impoverished youth worldwide through training in the performing arts. That experiential learning process that makes it so that I am disciplined, I am goal setting, I do that. Not just something I've heard about. And so, so we've been able to partner with some amazing places across. And some of you know about Rising Star Outreach of India. Yeah, we actually have the executive director, the, the president here, Tyler. We are so excited to be working with them. For the past eight years, we've been running programs in leprosy colonies in India. Impossible dreams. I didn't know enough to dream about. And I've been teaching life skills through dance to these kids, and we've created the first ever. Uh, well, here, here's some of, the, some of the beginning stages of the teaching process while we were there. And we started the first ever dance troupe, created out of youth from leprosy colonies in the history of the world. Impossible dreams. I didn't know enough to dream about. And they have now performed for over 13,000 people, lifting the stigma of leprosy off the minds of the masses. They're on the front lines of the battle, getting rid of leprosy, eradicating it in the world. They're amazing pioneers of today. Here we are in the, in the prisons in, in Kenya, and working in, uh, in, in the 17 to 21 year olds in the slums. I was actually there during the Civil War of Kenya. I had to go into hiding. And for those weeks that I was in hiding, they gave me their clothing off their back. They gave me a place to live. They gave me their beds. They slept on the floor so I could sleep in their beds. They gave me food to eat. And I taught them. I gave them what I had to give. And one of those, actually these, these kids should have been killing each other. They were on opposite sides but we were in a little corrugated tin hut learning how to work together and to, and to set goals and to be, have tolerance and, and collaboration. And one of them, this kid right here, 11 years old, Gilbert Njoroge. <laughs> I just talked to him on Facebook yesterday. He's 17 years old now. He, just, he finished high school on scholarship. And he is today taking his exams to see how well he will do to get into university. I love this guy. And 
Here he is on a, on a future trip. I showed up and, and literally he ran in the dirt road in the streets, ran towards me, gave me a big hug. I didn't recognize him. It had been three years since I'd seen him. And he gave me a big hug and he told me, anyway, took him to the prison with me where I was gonna teach classes. And I was struggling a bit with the, the language thing. He speaks Swahili. <laughs> Think about that, really? Hmm, yeah, he lives there. So he, <laughs> so he took over, he says, I've got this, don't worry. And so I stepped up, step back. And he is the younger than all of the inmates. And he stood up there and he explained these principles and how they're applying in his life and how they made him work for him in school and education and how he's now helping his grandmother to, uh, to pay rent. And there he is, teaching. Another dream that I never, ever, ever could have dreamed about. I was traveling across, yeah, we'll finish up here really quick. Sorry, some of you are leaving. <laughs> but we, um, I was doing a lecture tour across the northern India, and I got a phone call, an email, from Dr. Ugandar, who is the president of the, world, the Council for the World United. And he said, I've heard about what you've been doing and we would like to invite you to come and speak at the World Parliament on Spirituality. Um, are you going to be around? Can you come to Hyderabad for that? Uh, sure. When is it? Uh, and so, so I accepted to speak about disabilities and spirituality, and arts and culture and spirituality. And arrived and was able to share what we take for granted to these other people who understand that this age of enlightenment is coming. And all of these amazing people, like I mean, another dream that I had no idea, and this will, this will be the last, last one, and we'll wrap it up. But um, the church asked me to grow this, just so you all know. <laughs> really doesn't matter, uh, but it, it is a, a kind of a cool thing that they asked me to grow it so that, well, first to be Stephen. So will you be Stephen, please? And I, I, was like, I was like, okay. And then right before it said, actually, there's a change. Would you mind being the penitent thief crucified next to Christ? Um, okay. Stone to death, crucified. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. So I come in and I, it's one of the most spiritual, amazing, powerful experiences I've ever had turning while hanging on a cross, turning and looking at Christ and being told, see you in paradise. So powerful, beautiful. So here, here is uh, one of them. And then right after that, I was supposed to teach at BYU Hawaii, and I wasn't allowed to have this. And so they said, so right before I cut it, I moved to Hawaii, and it happened to be that my landlady was a photographer, and she said, let's take some pictures. And, and then we decided, let's do it like Christ. And let's, so, some really cool uh, things happen with that uh, that we'll, I'll talk about in the fireside sometime. But <laughs> new series is out called Meditation of Christ. And I had no idea that ever, as an artist, would be able to portray my Savior. And so here are some of the pictures that are now out there and available to share the light of Christ. I had no idea, no idea that these things were in my path. There was no way. All of these experiences and this journey, I had no way to be able to dream about it when I was growing up. I'm still that poor little kid from Mesa, Arizona. That kid. The, the hair kid. I'm still that kid who put the dance belt over his tights. <laughs> That's me. I take ownership. That's me. And the path I've been led has not been a path I could have dreamed about. I wrote a, a quick little thing. We're gonna, we'll, we'll end on this. I've traveled much of the world living in palaces and slums, dying with kings and beggars. I've held a dying child in my arms and carried mutilated bodies from the devastation of war. I performed with world-class artists on Broadway stages and danced with traumatized victims of human trafficking. And I've lifted survivors from the rubble of the World Trade Center and bathed with Hindu priests in the waters of the sacred Ganges. 
I've gone into hiding in the slums during the Civil War of Kenya, I danced and sang with my brothers in African prisons, and rubbed shoulders with Hindu swamis, Taoist priests, Buddhist monks, and sun god gurus while presenting at world parliaments and global summits. I've seen the awe-inspiring wonders of the world, but none inspired me more than the wonder in the eyes of an orphan child yearning to learn. I've received standing ovations from tens of thousands over the years, but the most memorable ovations I have come from I have come from toothless grandmothers smiling and tearful hugs in remote leprosy colonies in India. What really matters? How can we use what has been given to us? Neither fame nor fortune, power nor prestige, health, wealth nor wisdom have any redeeming value as to an end unto themselves, only as a means to an end. Lifting humanity. You all have impossible dreams that you will go out and will become possible. I ask you to open your mind to the limitless. Your future is filled with impossible dreams that you cannot.